Welcome to Module 6, The Importance of Local Policy for Achieving Equitable Outcomes. In this module, we will look at why policy, at the city and county levels in particular, is important to health equity efforts. Then we will provide an overview of four key strategies in the policy development process. By the end of this module, you will be able to discuss why policy, especially local policy, is valuable to achieving equitable health and safety outcomes. Describe 10 advantages of local policy and outline four broad strategies for developing local policy. As you may recall from Module 4, we introduced the spectrum of prevention. It is a framework for developing a comprehensive set of prevention strategies to address health equity efforts. The sixth level of the spectrum is influencing policy and legislation. Activities at this level focus on creating, modifying, or enforcing policies that affect health and safety. We define policy as the rules and activities of the government that shape every aspect of our lives and determine our quality of life through allocation of resources, zoning, and other rules. Changes in local, state, and national laws as well as the adoption of formal policies by boards and commissions fall under the umbrella of policy and legislation. Influencing policy usually presents the opportunity for the broadest improvement in health and safety outcomes. Policy can both reflect the norms or attitudes of society and shape behaviors, which is why policy is so important to achieving equitable health and safety outcomes. Policies can signal public awareness of problems viewed as unacceptable, and policies can also be used to stimulate new social norms for accepted behaviors. Seatbelt laws provide a good illustration of the relationship between policy, norms, and health behavior. Today, most people wear their seatbelts when in a vehicle, but this was not the case just 20 or 25 years ago, before it was commonplace to get in a car without buckling up. Through advocacy, education, research, and policy, it became clear that buckling up was a low-cost way to save lives and reduce motor vehicle injuries. Law enforcement agencies are required to cite people who aren't buckled up. This creates a powerful push for people to use their seatbelts. Now, seatbelt usage hovers over 80% in states which have primary seatbelt laws. In this case, policy has been a powerful lever in shifting from a norm of no belt usage to a norm where most people in most states are buckling up. So how does policy influence inequity? There are many examples that show how policy has been used to establish and reinforce inequitable circumstances. For example, a policy called the Restrictive Covenant was used widely to establish and reinforce residential segregation. The policy and practice of redlining has resulted in limited financial resources and services in certain neighborhoods along race and class lines. An unequal enforcement of environmental laws have resulted in low-income communities and communities of color experiencing disproportionate exposure to toxins, landfills, Superfund sites, and other environmental injustices. In practice, these policies have created and reinforced inequities for communities of color and low-wealth communities. But policy can also be used proactively as a tool to achieve equity. Using the example of segregation, policy can actively be used to reverse the legacy of segregation by ensuring that people who live in concentrated poverty or in places with severely limited access to opportunities, gain equal access to capital, housing, and other forms of opportunity that are central to health, safety, and well-being. Despite the important role of policy in shaping health behaviors and outcomes, Prevention Institute learned from a series of interviews with public health practitioners working in local health departments that there are a number of barriers to engaging in policy efforts. We've included some of the most commonly cited barriers here. Issues of limited or categorical funding and the belief that policy work may not be appropriate for people working in local health departments were among the most frequent reasons that health practitioners may choose to shy away from policy efforts. 
Another reason health practitioners, particularly those working at the local level, may avoid working on policy is because it's easy to think of policy as something that happens over there, like in Washington, D.C., or in the state's capital. But a lot of useful policy happens at the city, county, and regional levels. Local policies affect the practices and programs of virtually any city or county governmental or quasi-governmental agency. Regulation, resource allocation, contracting, planning, community development, oversight and review are among the key functions of local government. This fact holds great promise for health equity efforts. For example, local policy can help to restructure the spaces and distribution of opportunity in places of concentrated poverty at the neighborhood, zip code, city, or county level. Local policy is a fulcrum for change. As the Municipal Research and Services Center states, policymaking at this level is often undervalued and misunderstood, yet it is the central role of city, town, and county legislative bodies. Recently, the role of local policy has emerged with renewed vitality. Now there is clearer understanding that community design, development, redevelopment, and transportation policies influence health, safety, and equity. In the next several slides, we'll provide a quick overview of why local policy is critical to health equity. Here are some reasons local policy is critical. Among the key reasons, local policy can have a big local impact. Local policy can help spread the word and build movement. Local policy is relatively easier to accomplish, measure, and achieve success. And finally, local policy works to catalyze other localities, resulting in better outcomes. In all communities, but especially in communities where civic engagement is low, local policy efforts have the potential to create community momentum and build social capital. Getting neighbors working together and advocating for their needs and concerns may ultimately lead to the greatest level of community change, particularly if it is successful. Prevention Institute has written a paper outlining why local policy is an important tool for health equity. The full paper is available on our site. The rest of this module provides an overview of the key points from the paper. The next slide takes a closer look at each of these four reasons. Local policies can have a big impact. Many of today's complex community issues, such as safety, affordable housing, and high-quality jobs, demand a multi-sectoral approach and the participation, actions, expertise, resources, and people power that come from different sectors of local government. National policies have much more of a one-size-fits-all approach, but local policies can be crafted to respond to specific local needs, and they can build on the regional assets. Local policy is usually easier and quicker to enact and implement than state or federal legislation, where layers of bureaucracy can impede swift change. At the local level, it's easier to form strong, multifaceted community networks and make inroads into local agencies, which can facilitate policy change. At the municipal or county level, leadership from different sectors are more likely to know one another, and the smaller scale of local versus national politics can also foster a better understanding of the intersecting relationship between health and other issues. Local policy can help spread the word and build a movement. Gaining access to national officials may seem like an unrealistic expectation for most people. However, getting an appointment with the mayor, speaking with city council members, or talking to the local health officer should be more achievable. Local political leaders should be aware of their constituents' concerns. Many local and regional decision-making, environmental review, and planning processes legally require local agencies to incorporate community input. This can be a mechanism to include diverse voices, especially communities of color and low-income communities, which have historically been left out. Local policy is a way to engage community residents in developing solutions and monitoring implementation. 
Local policy is, relatively speaking, easier to accomplish and measure, and this can help achieve success. Health, safety, and equity are determined by major social, physical, and economic forces. For example, decisions that determine the quality of education may be made at federal and state levels, but they are also manifest in communities, cities, and counties. Complex issues like global trade policy may become evident locally as jobs and industry flee or the abundance of products from abroad result in the expansion of ports or transportation corridors to move these global goods. To the extent that residents are concerned about such issues, it's possible to have an impact on them through local action. Some of the most important health and social justice issues may seem overwhelming at a global or national level, but concrete steps can be taken at the local level. Local stakeholders can also ensure responsible implementation. Change or inaction are more evident at the local level, and local residents, when truly engaged, can provide a mechanism for oversight and sustainability of local initiatives. Local policy can act as a catalyst. Sometimes the hardest part of local policy change is getting started. When facing controversial issues, some political leaders relish being first, but many political leaders are fearful of being first, wrong, stigmatized, or sued. Once an ordinance passes in one's locale, it's a lot easier to enact the same regulation in other venues. Local policies can also be contagious, bubbling up to catalyze statewide and national change. Sometimes this occurs once a groundswell of local initiatives has been established, acting as the tipping factor for state or federal legislation. Now that we've covered why local policy is so valuable, let's do an overview of how to do local policy. Here are four key steps. They each have a number of sub-steps in them. First, select a policy priority. There must be a specific goal, and if this goal is not being met, investigate whether a new policy is necessary or if an existing one simply needs to be enforced or needs tweaking. Once policy goals are identified, it is time to select a specific policy for focused advocacy efforts. For example, many states have laws already on the books about the required minutes of physical education that children should receive in school but there is generally little or no enforcement of this law. Consider who will be impacted by the policy and the ways they will be impacted. Also, examine the political climate and work with advocates and people who understand the process. At this step, you'll want to research recent policy activities and consider whether administrative or legislative action is needed. Policy change can take place in a number of venues. With a specific policy priority in mind, determine the jurisdiction or jurisdictions responsible for the type of policy being considered. Councils, boards, commissions, districts, and authorities are among the key policy-making bodies in any local or regional jurisdiction. The makeup, governance, and authority of each entity differs from locale to locale, so any effective policy effort will begin with a thorough understanding of who has the power to make decisions, how and when decisions are made, and where formal recommendations for new policy should be directed. In devising a policy strategy, weigh some different approaches to achieving equitable outcomes. Sometimes, a public policy that impacts everyone can have a big effect on the health of the most vulnerable populations. Universal policies are often thought of as blanket policies because they are supposed to apply to everyone in the same way. The phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats, could be applied to universal policies because the aim is to improve everyone's situation. Many policies use this approach. For example, policies that required the removal of lead from paint and gasoline applied to all new paint and gasoline products. This universal policy was designed to prevent most of the population from new exposure to lead. Cases of lead poisoning have plummeted over the course of the three decades since the lead-free policies were adopted. Still, we know that low-income people, 
people with poor nutrition and people living in older homes tend to experience the negative impacts of lead exposure at greater rates. In this case, a universal policy has made a striking difference and there are still opportunities to improve marginalized or special populations. At other times, it may be preferable to use targeted solutions. Targeted policies impact specific and often vulnerable populations, such as children or the elderly or people in specific geographic regions, which may include communities of color or low-income communities. The fast food moratorium in South Los Angeles, California, is an example of a targeted approach. The policy called for a one-year halt to the development of new fast food establishments in South Los Angeles, a specific city council district that had a dearth of healthy food access, an abundance of cheap and unhealthy food, and disproportionately high rates of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. John Powell from Moritz College coined the phrase targeted universalism to describe policies that proactively connect people to jobs, stable housing, and good schools. In his view, targeted policies that recognize the needs of marginalized groups must be addressed in a coordinated and effective manner. Policies may be universal or targeted or anywhere in between. Second, Develop key partners and identify policy champions, people who are passionate about the issue. Don't forget to identify who might help or, just as importantly, who might hinder the process. Third, be prepared to back up your case. It is important to frame the policy in terms that make it understandable. Evidence is valuable, but don't assume that a lack of data and information is holding people back from making good decisions. Money can be a stumbling block. Where possible, it's helpful to calculate how much the policy will cost, how much a policy will save, and, if this is known, to communicate the cost of doing nothing. And of course, court the media. People cannot support what they don't know about, and favorable media attention can be a boon to your policy goals. David Brower, an environmentalist, said, Don't expect politicians, even good ones, to do your job for you. Politicians are like weather vanes. Our job is to make the wind blow. In truth, politicians can be partners or adversaries, depending on the issue. But even the ones that support your ideas won't do the work alone. Part of your job is to help politicians to see why they should support it and who, namely their constituents, supports it. Most importantly, with a well-crafted strategy and a well-coordinated approach, politicians will be more likely to take action on health equity issues. Finally, plan for implementation and evaluation. It's important to make sure that what you are proposing is achievable within reason. It's also important to think about the repercussions of the policy. Will some communities benefit more? Do other communities suffer unduly? And can the policy be implemented? Some of these questions may have come up earlier in the process, but it is essential that acceptable answers are found before moving forward. It's important to consider how the impact of the policy will be evaluated to prove that it was successful or so changes can be made as necessary. Policy isn't for policy's sake. The idea is to make a situation better. Evaluation helps determine if things actually are better. Local policy, when used as a tool, has the capacity to redesign communities and reshape norms to create a healthier population. It is another tool available to public health professionals to reshape lives. Sometimes nonprofit organizations and government agencies are concerned they are restricted from being involved in the policymaking process. In fact, there is a wide range of activities that their groups can engage in that can help influence policy development. This includes sharing data about community health status and community assets and risks that impact health, highlighting lessons learned from research and practice about strategies to promote health equity, and facilitating communication between community residents and public officials. 
Public and nonprofit agencies can engage in these activities and are also free to comment on proposed administrative regulatory changes, which includes school boards and planning commission decisions. Writing letters of support, providing statistics for or analysis of a bill, and reaching out for media attention, among other actions, can be helpful. Policy changes don't just happen. People and groups make them happen through collective action. To recap, let's take a moment to review the key points of this module. Policy, particularly local policy, can be a useful tool to help achieve equity goals. We emphasized four distinct advantages of local policy. These included that local policy can be a catalyst and can also engage local constituents in creating change. Finally, we covered four major steps in the policymaking process. They included selecting a policy priority, developing a strong base of support, backing up your case, and planning for implementation and evaluation. A full paper on health and health equity, the value of local policy provides a deeper look at the issues covered here. Please continue on to the next module when you are ready.